Hey, this is TV Crazy Man. If you grew up in the 70s and 80s, then you'll love this video as we take a look back at some great Saturday morning memories and TV facts from the past. Some of these shows you may not have thought about for years or just completely forgot about. Amen. Who is the greatest superhero of all? Is it Superman? No? I bet you're going to say it's Hong Kong Fooey. Could be! Because in this video, I got some facts about the greatest crime fighter in the history of television. The original episodes aired from September 7th to December 21st, 1974, and ran in repeats until 1976. Hong Kong Fui is the secret identity of Penry Pooch, working at a police station as a mild-mannered janitor for Sergeant Flint. Now let me know in the comments how many of y'all thought his name was actually Henry. See, because I thought it was Henry the whole time, after all these years. Is this kind of like the Mandela effect or something? I don't know. Now, Penry was always causing Sarge problems, and it's kind of hard to say if it was on purpose or just completely unintentional. <laughs> Here you are! <laughs> my examination papers! Ooh, ooh, my trophy! Henry! Penry listens in, has Rosemary, the telephone operator, takes calls on crimes in the city, and then he runs to a secret room where he jumps into a filing cabinet and transforms into the great Hong Kong Fu. After Spot the Cat lets him out, of course. The Hong Kong Fu's car could turn into anything a helicopter, a boat, just anything that he needed whenever he hit his gong. Now, Hong Kong Fu always depend upon his book, Hong Kong Book of Kung Fu from the Hong Kong School of Kung Fu, for answers to defeat bad guys or solve any problem. I'm to see if my Hong Kong Book of Kung Fu has a good way to catch cooks who make bad money. Now, Hong Kong Fu was, of course, revered as the most popular superhero in the world, even though Spot the Cat did most of the actual work. Of course, Fooey always thought he had done it somehow, moving so fast that even he himself missed the bad guy's defeat. Funny thing, Spot. I moved so fast I never even saw myself get it. <laughs> Fooey was so popular with the citizens that even if he knocked them down or accidentally beat them up while he was in action, they thought of it as an honor to be roughed up by the great Hong Kong Fooey. What an honor to have had my expensive hat destroyed by the magnificent Hong Kong Fooey! Hong Kong Fui was voiced by Scatman Crothers, who is familiar to every kid of the 70s, at least by the sound of his voice, if not by his name. He did work on the Globetrotters cartoon as Metal Arc Lemon, and then as Nate Branch, the Liquid Man on the Super Globetrotters. He was in several episodes of the new Scooby-Doo movies, Scat Cat in the 1970 animated movie The Aristocats, and then in the 80s he was Jazz the Autobot on the Transformers. He did a lot of guest appearances on live action television and starred in a lot of movies as well. He was in an episode of The Incredible Hulk, starred in 65 episodes of Chico and the Man, an episode of Charlie's Angels, Starsky and Hutch, The Harlem Globetrotters on Gilligan's Island TV movie, and in the movies Bronco Billy with Clint Eastwood, The Shining, and Twilight Zone the movie. He also made a lot of records and sang the Hong Kong Fui theme song, which has helped make Hong Kong Fui so memorable to generations of fans. Hong Kong Fui, number one super guy. Hong According to IMDb, like Mark Twain, he was born the year Haley's comic returned to Earth in 1910 and died the year the comic came back around again in 1986. Sergeant Flint was voiced by Joey Ross, who is best known as Officer Gunter Tootie in the 1960s TV series Car 54, Where Are You? Ross was famous for saying, Ooh, ooh, whenever he got upset, and that was started with the Phil Silvers show. I read somewhere he started saying that whenever he couldn't remember his lines, which of course became his trademark. As Flint, Ross revived Tootie's Oh. Kathy Gore did the voice of Rosemary the Operator. Well, hello, police headquarters. This is Rosemary, the divinest of the finest. Gore did numerous voices for Hannah Barbera, such as Lori in Inch High Private Eye, 1973, Katie Butler in Valley of the Dinosaurs in 74, and additional voices for the new Tom and Jerry show in 1975. Don Messick did the voice of Fooey's buddy, the cat named Spot. 
Messick was the original voice of Scooby-Doo, who he voiced for years from 1969 until his retirement. He did a ton of other characters too as well, including Boo Boo Bear and Ranger Smith in the Yogi Bear Show, and some robots in the Transformers in the 80s. Hong Kong Fui was a member of the Scooby Doobies on Laugh Olympics in 1977. Hong Kong Fui appears in the new Wacky Races episode, Hong Kong Screwy, and was voiced by Phil Lamar. In this cartoon, he is referred to as Penrod instead of Penreed the janitor. The racers encounter him in China and help him fight the forces of the evil organization KITTY, led by Golden Paw. Hong Kong Fui's origin was also revealed. It was almost a Hong Kong Fui movie with the voice of Eddie Murphy as Hong Kong Fui, and it sounded a lot like Donkey from Shrek. I'm this city's number one super guy. You a mean green fighting machine. Together we'll scare the spit out of anybody that crosses us. I think growing up in the 70s watching Hong Kong Fui is probably what inspired me to create my cartoon cat, Claw, the Kung Fu Cat. <laughs> Wonderbug was a live action series and was shown as part of the segment of uh, the Croft Super Show, which also included Magic Mongo, Bigfoot and Wild Boy, Dr. Shrinker, The Lost Saucer, and Electro Woman and Dino Girl. Now, this was a show I loved as a kid. Wonderbug was basically a superhero in automobile form before Knight Rider ever existed. He could fly, jump, and transform. In each episode, he'd start out in his junkyard alter ego of Schlepcar, and when trouble come around, he'd transform into the super cool Wonderbug. Now, Wonderbug appeared to be actually alive because he could talk in sort of a, in a mumbling voice kind of thing, and he would uh, be able to drive himself and act like a hero without the help of his human drivers. I guess if you had to compare him, he basically was Knight Rider, Speed Buggy, and Herbie all rolled into one. Wonderbug's powers seemed to be related to his magic horn that was on the side of the car. Anytime he would, sometimes he would lose the horn, and the teenagers that drove Wonderbug would have to get it back just in time for Schlepp Car to change into Wonderbug and save the day. The mumbling voice of Wonderbug was done by cartoon voice actor Frank Welker. Now he's the actor that does the voices of Fred and Scooby-Doo. Wonderbug was so human, he had eyeball headlights and his bumpers were made to look like different facial expressions. Now on occasion, Wonderbug would be replaced by a puppet to show off uh, his facial expressions more effectively. Uh, of course, I didn't notice that as a kid. I mean, hey, TV screens were really small back then. Now here's one lost in time and space. There's a lot of things you can't do like me. Including disappearing. Okay. In 1976, Macduff the Talking Dog aired and ran for 11 episodes. 13 were made, but it was canceled before they all ran. The dog sounded a lot like Mr. Ed and was actually a ghost and could disappear and reappear. Unfortunately, from what I've read, there's only one episode left. The editors apparently were destroyed in a fire. So if you want to see this series, it'll have to be from someone's personal recordings of the show from those very few original airings. You know, it's a little perplexing to me, though. How does a talking ghost dog fail on Saturday mornings in the 1970s? In 1977, Bigfoot and Wild Boy was created as a segment for the Croft Super Show, which was a live-action Saturday morning collection of various shows. A legendary Bigfoot who, eight years ago, saved a young child lost in the vast wilderness and raised that child until he grew up to be Wild Boy. Bigfoot and Wild Boy seemed to copy the six million dollar man's bionic Bigfoot with similar sound effects and running in slow motion. The six million dollar man Bigfoot introduction episode was written, of course, by Kenneth Johnson. As far as I know, Johnson had nothing to do with Bigfoot and Wild Boy, though. Now, there were no new episodes for Bigfoot and Wild Boy in 1978, but in the summer of 79, Bigfoot and Wild Boy got their own half an hour series without the Croft Super Show. Now, why it debuted in the summer is kind of weird. Now, I remember vaguely being very excited as a kid to get to see brand new episodes on Saturday morning. And in the summer, which was very unusual. I'm sure you're familiar with the Ghostbusters movie and its animated series, but today 
we're going to discuss the first Ghostbusters to hit television screens way back in 1975. It featured those two great actors, Forrest Tucker and Larry Storch, who starred together in a similar buddy role on the western comedy series F Troop. This Ghostbusters was a Saturday morning TV show developed by Filmation Studios, and it wasn't actually related to the movie Ghostbusters. Filmation created a ton of Saturday morning favorites, including Superman, Batman, Shazam. Secrets of Isis and Fat Albert. The series characters featured a gorilla named Tracy. This tape will self-destruct in five seconds. <laughs> With Eddie Spencer and a human named Kong, just to confuse the audience, I guess. And these guys were like a crazy team of paranormal detectives who had their own ghost busting machine, the Ghost Dematerializer. <laughs> Some of their more famous ghost encounters involved Dr. Frankenstein and his monster, a mummy, the Red Baron, the Canterville Ghost, Count Dracula, Billy the Kid, Bell Star, the captain and first mate of the Flying Dutchman, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde even. The show was a big hit, but Filmation wanted to put their money on their number one new hit, Shazam and the Isis Hour. So only one season with 15 episodes was filmed, which they likely regretted later as Isis uh, started to go downhill just a little bit after that first season. I got showbiz on the brain! Yeah, and you're playing to an empty house. <laughs> In 1984, the movie Ghostbusters, you know, the one with Dan Aykroyd and Bill Murray, had to pay Filmation for the rights to use the name Ghostbusters. <laughs> With the success of the movie in 1984, Filmation revisited their old version of Ghostbusters in a new animated series in 1986, while the movie version of Ghostbusters had its own animated series called The Real Ghostbusters, which ran from 86 to 91. Now, Filmation's animated Ghostbusters only ran for one season in the daytime syndication market, but they created an amazing 65 episodes in one year. They even produced toys based on the show's characters. Now, Forrest Tucker and Larry Starch had previously starred together on F Troop from 1965 to 1967. Now, if you haven't seen this series, but you love classic comedies, then you need to see this series. It, it, it's just hilarious. Now, F Troop was set between the years 1865 and 1867 and featured the most bumbling band of misfit soldiers to ever grace the television screen. Now, I remember coming home from school one day and discovering this show for the first time in reruns. I mean, the nice thing about being young is <laughs> everything is new, even old reruns. Now, Forrest Tucker and Larry Storage, they must have been great pals because they worked together again on the 1981 TV movie, The Ventures of Huckleberry Finn, and an episode of Love American Style, and Grizzly Adams on an episode entitled Gold is Where You Find It back in 1977. Now, that's the series about a mountain man who has a giant bear for a pet. Now, Tucker wasn't just a comedian. He was also in a lot of uh, action movies, including the 1949 Sands of Iwo Jima with John Wayne. That's war, boy. What's war? Trading real estate for men. Now, Larry Storch, who just died in 2022 at the age of 99, was a huge part of classic TV Saturday mornings. He was the voice of the Joker for the 60's Filmation Batman cartoon series, Phineas J. Whoopi on Tennessee Tuxedo. Ah, yes! <laughs> Let's see. Whoopi! And other voice work in shows like The Pink Panther, Groovy Ghoulies, The Inspector, The Brady Kids, and a lot more. Now, Bob Burns was the human inside the gorilla suit for Ghostbusters. He was best known for his work with and collection of movie props for horror and sci-fi movies. Now, at the time, there was a lot of people who actually thought 
That was a real gorilla. This tape will self-destruct in five seconds. Wow, you should have seen that thing. It took off like a rocket. Hey, this is TV Crazy Man. Today we're going to talk about Captain Caveman. He debuted in the series Captain Caveman and the Teen Angels in 1977. The Teen Angels were sort of a parody of Charlie's Angels. Captain Caveman's design was taken from the 1968 Wacky Races series characters called the Slag Brothers. And they were basically cavemen that looked pretty much exactly like Captain Caveman, club and all. The story structure was basically like Scooby-Doo, where the Teen Angels would find clues that led to the capture of a bad guy at the end of the episode. And they would usually have to unmask the bad guy, just like on Scooby. The only difference was the bad guy wasn't usually dressed as a monster, at least not every in every case. And just like the Scooby gang, the Teen Angels had their own van, except Captain Caveman lived on top of the van in his cave. The open narrative explains to the viewer that Captain Caveman was set free by the Teen Angels from his frozen block of ice. Now the constant companion to the Teen Angels, Brenda, Dee Dee, and Taffy. Now if you notice right there in that narrative in the intro, they got Dee Dee and Brenda's names mixed up. Now Captain Caveman would often shout his name before taking off to catch a bad guy, kind of like a war cry. Captain but often his power would just give out. Bunga bunga, bad time for energy crisis. <laughs> Now once in the episode Prehistoric Panic, he got stuck in high gear and he flew himself and the angels backward into time to his original time and place. Captain Caveman's people seem to have been more primitive than the world of the Flintstones, even though the hero would join the Flintstones in their 80s series. Now, Captain Caveman could pull all kinds of prehistoric tools and creatures from his hair, which covered his entire body. <laughs> now, here's a rare glimpse of what Captain Caveman looks with a haircut and a shave. <laughs> his club helped him fly and contained tools that would pop out of the top. He also had super strength that, again, would sometimes fail him. His favorite word was unga bunga. Unga bunga. Sometimes Captain Caveman would eat things that aren't considered food, like bikes, TV sets, etc., etc. Unga bunga, me love candy cane. The series was created by Joe Ruby and Ken Spears for Hanna-Barbera. Those guys were responsible for a lot of shows back then, like one of my favorites, Thundar the Barbarian. There were 40 episodes in all that ran from 1977 to 1980. The show was originally a segment of Scooby-Doo's Life Olympics and then Scooby's All-Stars, in which Captain Caveman also appeared in the game sequences as a player on the Scooby-Doo team. In the last season of that series, Captain Caveman was shown separate from Scooby's Olympic show. Dee Dee Skies was voiced by Renee Watson as the brains of the team. I think we just found our second clue. Come on! You are a classic TV expert. If you guessed, her other famous role was that of Will Smith's mother, Viola Smith, on The Fresh Prince. The next character is Brenda Chance. She was the scaredy cat of the bunch, making her more of the shaggy of the gang. She was voiced by Marilyn Schreffler, 
who did voice work on a huge list of cartoon shows in the 70s and 80s, including the voice of Olive Oil on the all-new Popeye Hour. That was another favorite of mine. She did a few on-screen performances, including Simon and Simon, Remington Steel, Airwolf, and Newhart. Isn't he flying awfully fast? Taffy Dare was the blonde girl of the group who loved to shout Zowie. Zowie! This could be our first clue! She seems to have a crush on Captain K-Man in the series. She was voiced by Laurel Page, who did voice work on cartoons like The Littles, The Dukes, and The Snorks. She also appeared in the movie St. Elmo's Fire as a nurse. The king of Saturday morning himself, Mel Blanc, did the voice of Captain K-Man. Captain K-Man! Blank was famous for his work on Looney Tunes, where he voiced Bugs Bunny and, well, almost all the characters from the Looney Tunes, like Marvin the Martian, Tweety, Porky Pig, Daffy Duck, and Elmer Fudd, just to name a few. He also did a ton of voices for Hanna Barbera, including the voice of Barney Rebel. He also had his own radio show, and he was a big part of the Jack Benny show from the golden age of television and radio. <laughs> Gary Owens was the narrator. He also did the voice of Space Ghost and Blue Falcon. Set free by the teen angels from his prehistoric block of glacier ice, comes the world's first superhero. Captain Caveman! Captain Caveman exists within the Flintstones universe, as he did show up in the Flintstone comedy show between 1980 and 82. In that series, he works at the Daily Granite with Wilma Flintstone and Betty Rebel. He even had a secret identity as Chester the Office Boy. His next show was between 86 and 88 as a backup segment on the Flintstones Kids in which he starred with his son. And Captain Caveman also appeared in the movies Scoob and Space Jam A New Legacy. And he appeared in the Scooby-Doo Mystery Incorporated episode Mystery Solvers Club State Finals. Captain Caveman alongside KV Jr. and the Teen Angels appeared in the 2021 series Jellystone. Captain Caveman and the Teen Angels, the complete series, was released on DVD in 2013. The Incredible Hulk 1982 animated television series was closely based on the Hulk comic books from Marvel. And the series only ran for 13 episodes on NBC and was part of a combined hour with Spider-Man and his amazing friends. I love this show as a kid. It's amazing how they were able to run the same episodes again the next season and keep it going without even one more new episode. The origin of the Hulk was presented much closer to the comics version than the live action version with Bill Bixby and Lou Ferrigno, which had just ended that same year. The supporting cast featured the comics characters Betty Ross, Rick Jones, General Ross, and Ned Talbot, who was actually named Glenn Talbot in the comics. The characters Rio and his only daughter Rita were added, and they didn't, but they didn't appear in the comic books. In this cartoon, the Hulk could talk, unlike the live-action series. They also went back to Bruce Banner instead of David Banner, as they did in the Bill Bixby series. Now, this was the second Hulk animated series. In 1966, the Hulk appeared in 13 seven-minute segments as part of TV's The Marvel Superheroes. The Spidey Goes Hollywood episode of Spider-Man and His Amazing Friends, first broadcast in late 1981, served as a something of a backdoor pilot for the Incredible Hulk cartoon show. Other changes from the comics was that the Hulk's best friend, Rick Jones, had long blonde hair and wore a cowboy hat all the time. It was a great series, but it did have one famous issue, and that whenever the Hulk changed back to Banner, his clothes would amazingly reappear. Perhaps it was just to the, the save time, explaining how Banner found new clothes in the middle of nowhere, or saving from half and to explain why he didn't have a shirt on to General Ross or Betty, and save us, the viewing audience, of wasted time that could have been better used for the Hulk smashing. Stan Lee did the narration for the show, which I always thought was awesome. But no mere miss can imprison the savage She-Hulk. 
Some of the same background music was used for the equally awesome show Dungeons and Dragons. And Boyd Kirkland did layouts for the show and would end up writing and directing on the Batman the Animated Series and X-Men Evolution. Paul Denny from the Batman Animated Series did some writing for the show, too. The Hulk's design was based on the art of Sal Buscema, who always did an awesome job of drawing the Hulk in the comic books of the day. Now here's something I didn't know that I just recently found out that's really cool. The voice of Bruce Banner was none other than Zan of the Wonder Twins, you know, from the Super Friends, cartoon voice actor Michael Bell. In 1973, he was Mark on the Hanna-Barbera series Speed Buggy. From 77 to 84, he played two of his best-known roles, Zan and Gleek, and he also voiced the Riddler on Challenge of the Super Friends. And he did provide the voice of Lex Luthor as a young man in the episode History of Doom. Now, it's, it's interesting to note that Bell later played Lex Luthor in the 1988 Superman series full-time. And here's something kind of interesting. Stan Jones, who was the voice of the adult Lex Luthor on the Super Friends, did uh, the voice of the leader on an episode of the Incredible Hulk animated series. Now, Michael Bell was also the voice of another DC superhero, another show I liked to watch back in the day from 79 to 81, Plastic Man. Now, this is interesting. He, he was big in the 80s. I mean, he was uh, several, he played several different Smurfs, and he was on the Transformers uh, animated show, and he was Duke on G.I. Joe. So, he, he was on a lot of cool stuff back in the 80s. The voice of the Incredible Hulk himself was done by Bob Holt, who sadly passed away at the early age of 56. He once complained that Bell got all the easy parts while he had to do the difficult growling scenes. I guess it was hard on his throat. <laughs> Previously, uh, before working on the Hulk, he had done the voice of Hanna Barbera's Grape Ape. You're in Dr. Banner's house, or what's left of it. Rick Jones was voiced by Michael Horton, who also appeared in a lot of uh, classic TV shows and films like MASH and Star Trek and 21 Jump Street. He did a lot of voiceover work and uh, animation in the 80s, including uh, uh, Transformers and uh, G.I. Joe. Look, there's Bruce on the floor over there. He's breathing normally. Now, B.J. Ward was the voice of Betty Ross, and she was also the voice of Scarlet on G.I. Joe, and, if you remember this one, Jane of the Jungle. Now, that show uh, came on alongside Godzilla, the Hand of a Bear Godzilla Power Hour. It was kind of a cool show back in the day. Now, she was also the voice of Velma Dinkley in Scooby-Doo on Zombie Island, The Witch's Ghost, Alien Invaders, and Scooby-Doo and the Cyber Chase. Oh, and she was also Betty Rubble in various Flintstones productions from the 80s to the early 2000s. And she did a lot of other animated series as well. Now, the music was one of the most awesome parts of this show. And the music was composed by Johnny Douglas, who sadly passed away in 2003. Douglas composed and conducted music for television series including, uh, including Spider-Man and His Amazing Friends, Dungeons and Dragons, uh, G.I. Joe, and the Transformers. So if you grew up in the 80s, the music of Johnny Douglas was a huge part of your childhood. Now out of the 13 episodes, some of the, the best episodes, the ones I remember the most, were the third episode, Origin of the Hulk, which is a retelling of the Hulk's origin. And the biggest difference between the comics version and this version was the replacement of a Russian spy with an alien that was seeking the secret of Bruce's Gamma Bomb. Now, episode 4, When Monsters Meet, featured a battle between the Hulk and Quasimodo, and was the only episode to not feature the army base. Instead, the action all took place in Paris. Now, this episode was remade into a one-shot comic book, which, of course, I bought when I was a, I was a kid. Episode 4, Seven featured my favorite subject, which is time travel, when the Hulk travels back in time and is faced with cavemen and dinosaurs. Episode 10 featured the Hulk's biggest enemy from the comics, the leader. In episode 11, guest starred the Hulk's cousin, She-Hulk, and Bruce and Rick travel to Los Angeles to visit Bruce's cousin, Jennifer Walters, to try to learn how she is able to maintain her intelligence when she changes into the She-Hulk, but their attempt is endangered thanks to the efforts of the terrorist group, Hydra. 
Monster Squad aired Saturday mornings on NBC from September 11, 1976 to September 3rd, 1977. Monster Squad featured a sort of comedic superhero team of monsters that do good deeds and fight bad guys in order to make up for the misdeeds of their past. The monster heroes included Dracula, Wolfman, and the Frankenstein's monster. According to the show, Walt, a criminology student who was also a night watchman at a wax museum, built a crime computer that somehow brought to life wax statues of the legendary monsters. In the show, the monsters all seem to have the memories of the real monsters, which leads you to believe that somehow they are the real deal that's been brought back to life. The group travels in a cool looking monster van. Each monster had a utility belt, like the 60's Batman. Creator Stanley Ralph Ross was one of the main riders from the Adam West Batman TV series, so he brought a lot of that campy fun to the Monster Squad. Julie Newmar, aka the Catwoman, even guest starred as the Ultra Witch on one episode. Frankenstein actor Michael Lane even played on a couple of episodes of Batman as the character Daddy Longlegs in the episodes Caught in the Spider's Den and The Black Widow Strikes Again. Oh, and Ross was also the voice of Gorilla Grodd on the challenge of the Super Friends. You puny Super Friends are no match for us. And worked to develop the Linda Carter Wonder Woman series of the 70s. Each monster had a CB code name, because CBs were big back then, of course. Walt was Chamber of Horrors, Dracula was Night Flyer, Frank was Green Machine, and the Wolfman was Furball. What else would you expect? All the monsters appear to be modeled after, but carefully different enough to not get into the legal trouble with Universal and their movie monster designs. The Frankenstein's monster was goofy, kind of like Herman Munster. You're gonna wipe them out, all of them, to the very last man. <laughs> but he went by the name of Frank N. Stein. Maybe, maybe the cows are just on strike. No. There has to be some utter reason, Bruce! But he had bolts on top of his head instead of his neck. And he was played by the uh, actor Mike Lane. Mike Lane, or Michael Lane, had played Frankenstein before, once on the movie Frankenstein 1970, which was actually made in 1958, but was set in the future. That movie's Frankenstein looked more like the mummy than Frankenstein, at least from the trailer, and I haven't actually seen the movie but I don't think they showed Lane's face uh, throughout the movie. Now, Mike Lane also played Frankenstein for the 1966 super funny rock group, The Monkees, in the episode Monstrous Monkey Mash. In that episode, he kind of had a, sort of a Elvis hairdo. Davy Jones, you shouldn't monkey around with a monster. Now, Dracula went by Drac and was played by Henry Pollock II. <laughs> Pharaoh. Pollock had a surprising connection to Batman as well, but it wasn't the 1966 Adam West series. It was as the voice of the Scarecrow, aka Dr. Jonathan Crane, on the Batman the Animated series. Now He did a lot of voice work for Scooby-Doo shows in the 80s, Yogi Bear, the Smurfs, Fonz and the Happy Days Gang, and Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventures. Probably his longest lasting role was that of Jerry Silver on Webster. Now the Wolfman called the werewolf in the intro. That also, I have a gun. That won't stop me. With silver bullets. That will stop me. <laughs> Went by the name of Bruce W. Wolf. He was played by Buck Cartalian. He was actually on an episode of Batman as well on the episode Hot Off the Griddle where he played a Julie Newmar's Catwoman henchman named John, which is ironic because he fought Julie Newmar's villainous character in the Monster Squad. So many ironies here. All dealing with Batman almost. Now, he actually appeared in the episode of the Monsters as well, as a workman in the episode Underground Monster. <laughs> And he also played an ape on the Planet of the Apes named Julius. He was the ape who was hosing down Charlton Heston. Now Walt, the only human and leader of the team, was played by Fred Grandy, who went on to have a very successful role as Gopher Smith in Love Boat. 
Yeah, 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 yeah. Now, Fred is the only one I wasn't able to find any connection to Batman whatsoever. Now, besides acting, Fred went on to serve four terms in Congress, and he uh, did a stint as a radio talk show host. To hold on to your Capricorn because here it comes. Several famous guest stars appeared on the Monster Squad, including Jonathan Harris, aka Mr. Smith from Lost in Space, who played the astrologer. Edward Andrews played Mayor Golan for two episodes. I remember him the most from two Twilight Zone episodes he played on U Drive and Third from the Sun. Frank Cady, a.k.a. Sam Drucker from Petticoat Junction and Green Acres, played a farmer who takes a shot at Drac. You ever seen a bat in these parts of Then there was uh, Avery Schreiber who played the weatherman. He had the distinct honor to be a regular on the so-called worst TV show in history, My Mother to Car. On the very first episode, Alice Ghostly, a.k.a. Esmeralda, from Bewitched, played the Queen Bee. Of course, I've already mentioned the great Catwoman Julie Newmar, who played the Ultra Witch. One of her henchmen was played by Richard Bacallian, who played on several episodes of the 66 Batman. He played on six episodes of Batman in total. There are so many connections to this show and Batman, it's almost spooky. I'll always remember being disappointed that the Monster Squad only made it one season. But I still recall having gotten a Monster Squad board game for my grandmother after the series was no longer airing. Now, to my knowledge, there isn't any connection to the TV series in the 1987 movie Monster Squad where the monsters there are straight up bad guys. Thunder the Barbarian was an awesome Saturday morning animated series created by Steve Gerber and produced by Ruby Spears Productions. The series ran for two seasons on ABC from October 1980 to September 1982 and was rerun on NBC in 1983. Thundar is set in the future ruins of America in a post-apocalyptic wasteland of Earth that is ruled by evil wizards. In this alternate Earth future, the moon was broken into two pieces. The shattered moon and the ruins of the former human civilization were caused by the passage of a runaway planet between the Earth and the Moon in 1994, which from scenes shown in the opening sequence caused radical changes in the Earth's climate and geography. Earth and Moon settle into a new balanced state. Earth is reborn with a world of savagery, super science and sorcery far more chaotic than old Earth. Isn't that funny how 1994 used to seem like such a long ways off the hero of the show, of course, is Thundar, who is a heroic barbarian who carries a sun sword that is very similar to a lightsaber from Star Wars. Thundar's friends are the lovely Princess Ariel and the monstrous Ukla the Mock, who also reminds me a little of Star Wars. He sounds a lot like Chewbacca and looks like him just a little bit, at least, except with shorts. Now that I think about it, why did Mock, who was completely covered with hair, wear those short shorts? is going to wear clothes. Why didn't he just at least wear pants? According to the series creator Steve Gerber, the network insisted a Wookiee-like creature be added to the series, and he got the name while walking past the UCLA campus. His friend said, hey, why not call him Ookla? Kind of like Ookla, like Oose, yeah, well, anyway. So this was born Thundar's best pal. Now, Jack Kirby, the guy who's credited with creating some of Marvel Comics' biggest heroes in the 60s, worked on the production design for the show along with Alex Toth. Princess Ariel could do magic and was the stepdaughter of an evil wizard named Sabian. She was an expert on Earth's history by reading his library. She would always explain to Thundar what was uh, what whenever they ran into something from Earth's past. You know, like a helicopter or rocket, whatever the case may be. Now she could make energy blasts, which was cool, and she seemed to like Thundar a lot, but being a Saturday morning cartoon, Thundar, uh, Thundar never really could return much in the way of affection, but uh, he is shown on the series to be very protective of her. So after the first two seasons, the network uh, wanted to make room for Laverne and Shirley in the Army slash Mork and Mindy cartoon, so Thundar moved to NBC where he was shown in reruns for at least one season. Now, who thought, who in the world thought that replacing a unique series like Thundar with a Laverne and Shirley cartoon was a good idea? 
Now, Fonz and the Happy Days Go uh, Gang was a great show. And so was the live version of Laverne and Shirley. But a cartoon, I mean, it just, you know, I never watched it. But, uh, now, I did watch Fonz and the Happy Days Gang cartoon because, well, the Fonz was cool, of course, and there was time travel. I just can't resist time travel. Now, according to writer Mark Evnar, I uh, hope I'm saying that right, there would have been a third season if Gary Marshall, uh, who in 1982 was the most powerful man around ABC because he was, you know, in charge of uh, Happy Days and more community, Laverne Shirley, all those big shows. If he had demanded the network clear a half an hour in their uh, Saturday schedule for a uh, Mork and Mindy Laverne and Shirley cartoon, well, then it probably would have got another season. And then Dar managed to get 21 episodes in two seasons. Scooby-Doo, Where Are You? was created by Joe Ruby and Ken Spears. These are the same guys that brought us Thundar the Barbarian in 1980. Scooby was produced by Hanna-Barbera for CBS way back in 1969. This very first and original version of Scooby ran for two seasons until 1970. Many various incarnations would follow. Uncle Scooby? Yeah. Hi! I'm Scrappy-Doo! Scrappy-Doo? There's actually a third season on DVD that was episodes that aired on Scooby's Laugh Olympics in 1978. Did you know originally Scooby was going to be named Too Much? Yes, the name of the dog was going to be Too Much. And the series was going to be called Mystery 5. And then Who's Scared? And uh, Fred hated the title. Hated the title Mysteries 5. Enthusiasm for the show was going right down the drain. And then finally, Fred says, You know, we talked about doing a show with Bob Denver, and it was going to be called Who's Scared. Now, believe it or not, originally Scooby and the gang were going to be musicians. Groovy, guys, really. At some point in the creation process, the CBS execs above Fred Silverman were worried that the show was too spooky and violent. So they renamed the show Scooby-Doo, Where Are You After the Dog? So they could focus on Scooby, which provided more humor to soften those scary backgrounds and spooky bad guys on the show. A light bulb went off and I said, we'll take that dog, we'll move him center stage, make him the star of the show, and call the show Scooby-Doo, Where Are You? Inspirations for Scooby-Doo originally were the Archies, but I believe they moved away from that and more towards Dobie Gillis for the designs of the teens, and then Abbott and Stella for the spooky comedy mystery angle. Scooby was basically Costello in Fred Silverman's mind. Come on, take it all out. If we could capture the essence of what Abbott and Costello did, then we would end up with a big hit. Interestingly enough, Hannah Bear had actually done an Abbott and Costello cartoon in the late 60s. Hey, and as I was saying, the teen designs were clearly inspired by the cast of Dobie Gillis. Fred was Dobie. My name's Dobie Gillis, and I'm in love with a girl named Thalia Menninger. Shaggy was patterned after Maynard G. Krebs. What? Would you mind moving on? How come? Well, no offense, Sonny, but this is a clothing store, and I'd hate to have anyone think that you just came out of here. Now, the beautiful Thalia that Dobie was always trying to win over on the many loves of Dobie Gillis lined right up with Daphne. Like, hi. Hi. Zelda Gilroy, the very intelligent, nerdy kind of girl, lined up with Velma, only without the glasses. <laughs> Uo Takamoto, who became kind of the, the head stylist and art director for the studio. Iwo Takamoto designed Scooby and created him by giving Scooby the exact opposite characteristics of what a stereotypical perfect version of a Great Dane would be. To make him funny, of course. Now, Scooby-Doo is one of the longest running cartoon series of all time, when you include all the various incarnations that have followed over the decades. Of course, Scooby-Doo, Where Are You is arguably the best, or at least one of the best series to star Scooby in the game. But let's look at the characters and the voices behind them. 
Sorry. First up is Casey Kasem and did the voice of Shaggy Rogers, Scooby-Doo's best pal. Shaggy, just like Scooby, can eat more food than anyone without ever gaining any weight for longer than five minutes at a time. You know those two, always hungry. Besides, they're probably so stuffed they can't move. I mean, he burns off a lot of calories with all the running from ghosts and goblins. And growing up in the 70s and 80s, I followed Casey from Saturday morning cartoons to his top 40 pop hits countdown on the radio. Welcome to America's Top 10. Right now, let's turn to the action on the Billboard Pop Singles Chart and count down the 10 biggest songs in the land this week. I even remember watching his quick 30-minute Top 10 show featuring short clips of 80s top videos at the time. Character I wanted to do was Fred. And so they said, no, we, we'd like you to read the, the other character, Shaggy. And Casey also did the voice of Robin the Boy Wonder on the Super Friends. I hope we can come up with something before Scorpio attacks again. Look out! And Casey would voice Shaggy all the way to the year 2009, with a few years in between when Scooby was uh, without a series for a little bit here and there. Now sadly, Casey passed away in 2014 at the age of 82. Having grown up listening to Casey, it's just amazingly hard to believe it's been that long since he's been gone. Now Fred Jones. Fred is the leader of the gang, of course. He's a man that loves to wear ascots. Look at that. The tracks go different directions. I have to describe Fred as being uh, the guy in the group who has a license. And that's why the other kids have him around, so he can drive the mystery machine. Hang on, gang! Nobody's been working longer on the cast of all the Scooby-Doo shows more than Frank Welker, who was the original voice of Fred Jones. And I guess still is the voice of Fred Jones for the most part, except for that last movie, Scoob. I think somebody else did it then. Now, he's even taken over for the voice of Scooby-Doo himself since 2002. Now, over the years, he's did the voice work for Garfield, Jabberjaw, Jetsons, The Smurfs, Dino Mutt, Fang Face, and lots more. He's also did work on the Super Friends, voicing Wonder Dog and Marvin White on the first season of that series. Now, currently, Welker is 76 years old. But when Scooby first aired, Welker was only 23 years old. He's been Fred Jones for 53 years now. Jeepers! Now Daphne Blake, aka Triple Prone Daphne, who's always getting in trouble, was first voiced by Stefana Christofferson for the first season and then Heather North afterwards. Yeah, she would fall down shoots and get the rest of the kids in trouble. She was very right for the character. So when the other girl left, I, fo I called Heather and I said, come down right away and audition for this. I think I hear them coming. Daphne, don't lean over so... Oh, oh, oh. Danger-prone Daphne did it again. Velma, the brainy girl, Velma Dinkley, who is always losing her glasses and always reminding us that she can't see without her glasses, was uh, her voice was done by Nicole Jaff. My glasses! I can't see without my glasses. There, that's better. <laughs> now Scooby-Doo, Scooby-Doo is of course a lovable Great Dane that is afraid of his own shadow, but will surprise you with a heroic act from time to time. He's usually the reason the gang catches the bad guy at the end of every episode. His favorite food, of course, is the Scooby snack, which he has to compete with uh, Shaggy for. Now. Why Shaggy likes to eat dog treats, I'm not sure. This Scooby Snack smells delicious. A Scooby Snack? <laughs> <laughs> Scooby-Doo himself was originally voiced by Don Messick. He's also voiced Astro from the Jetsons, Muttley, Ranger Smith from Yogi Bear, Papa Smurf, Dr. Benton Quest from Johnny Quest, and lots more. And Don was just brilliant at breathing life to that character. Unfortunately, he passed away back in 1997 at the age of 71. I think Don got into the psyche of an animal. That dog was alive, <laughs> and the, it, it was it was a being, a human being. <laughs> now, what really sets apart the original series from a lot of later ones is the fun chase scene music that played on the episode starting in the second season. The songs were performed by Austin Roberts. Roberts even recorded a different version of the Scooby theme song for the second season. Speed Buggy is a doom buggy resembling the aforementioned Wonder Bug. Of course, Speed Buggy came out first. But instead of a live action series, Speed Buggy was an animation uh, done by Hanna Barbera. Speed Buggy talked just like any other cartoon character and was 
obviously self-aware, and had very human-like eyes and a mouth. Speed Buggy being a racing car was pretty much a cross between Scooby-Doo and Herbie the Love Bug. Each week there was a different race and uh, some bad guy to fight. With the three young characters, they were similar to the Scooby Gang. Speed Buggy was voiced by cartoon legend Mel Blank. Yep, the same guy that did the voice of Bugs Bunny and a lot of the other Looney Tunes characters. Even though the show only lasted one original season in 1973, the, the original series was reran over several different networks over the years, creating fans from one generation to the next. After the original series, Speed Buggy went on to be one of the many other Hannibal Barrett characters to star in the Life Olympics cartoon a few years later. Speed Buggy would also go on to cameo in Johnny Bravo, My Life as a Teenage Robot, something I've never ever seen before in my entire life, Invader Zim, also something I've never seen in my entire life, Animaniacs, Scooby-Doo and Guess Who, and Futurama. He's also starred in one of the, uh, at least one of the new Scooby-Doo movie episodes of the early 70s, and Mystery Incorporated a few years back. Uh, he also did a cameo in the new Scooby-Doo uh, big budget movie, Scoob, and he's had some comic book appearances as well. In 2018, Speed Buggy was in a one-shot DC comic book with The Flash. And back in the 70s, Speed Buggy also had his own comic book series made by Charlton Comics. The Pebbles and Bam Bam Show was a Saturday morning cartoon and would lead to the Flintstones basically owning Saturday mornings during the 70s and 80s, almost as much as Scooby-Doo. I mean, there was all kinds of variations. That included Fred and Barney Meet the Thing, Fred and Barney Meet the Schmoo, Flintstones Comedy Hour, the comedy show, the Flintstones Kids, and even episodes on prime time in the form of a few specials here and there in TV movies. Pebbles and Bam Bam, it wasn't as good as the original series, but it wasn't an insult to it either. I mean, which is kind of what I'm afraid the new Fox series might be. I mean, who knows until it airs, but I mean, maybe a miracle will happen. But uh, anyway, Pebbles and Bam Bam in 1971 focused on the teenage years of these characters. They used some of the old gags as the original show, like the prehistoric gadgets that were usually made to work with small dinosaurs or birds. You know, I never could figure out how those phones worked back then without electricity or anything else. Operator? Hello? Hello, operator? Hello? Hello? Mm. Weirdly enough, I looked through all the episode descriptions and scanned around my DVD collection of this series and... You know, I didn't find any appearances of Dino. Like, where was he? Now, I know he did show up on the next season when the series turned into the Flintstone Comedy Hour. If it weren't for that, I'd almost think Dino had gotten old and passed away. How could you have a Flintstones without Dino? The only thing that threw me off was the fact that from 1971 onward, Bam Bam on any of the Saturday morning Flintstone shows was no longer super strong. That bugs me to this day. What happened to Bam Bam by his teenage years that, I mean, he should have been as strong as Superman by now. He was stronger as a toddler than the teenage Bam Bam. Interestingly enough, there's an episode where Pebbles drinks a strength formula on the Pebbles and Bam Bam show and gets the same level of strength you would have expected Bam Bam to have. I don't have any problems with Bam Bam's personality on this show. Like it or not. Really, but I, I don't know. I, I think I would have made him more of a surfer dude, like I did with my character Doug, son of Lug from my Stone Age modern family of time travelers that star in my book series, Caveman Comics. Now this is Doug Lug. He sounds like he's straight out of the 80s. Whoa, Dad, are you like totally okay? Whoa, like see you later, Dad, all right, bye. <laughs> The Pebbles and Bam Bam show had Fred, Barney, Wilma, and Betty all there, and they all appeared to seem to uh, avoid any kind of aging. Cartoon characters are just so lucky that way. Most of the old Flintstones voice cast was back, including Alan Reed as Fred, Gene Vanderpeel as Wilma, and Mel Blanc as Barney. What I find fascinating, though, is who voices Bam Bam and Pebbles. Bam Bam was voiced by Jay North, the child star that brought the comic strips Dennis the Menace to life in a very popular comedy that ran from 1959 to 1963. Relax, Pep. We got plenty of time. 
Jay hasn't had a lot of work since then. He's credited with a couple more things for the Flintstones and a handful of other shows. Here he is doing a skit in 1987 mocking himself as an out-of-work child actor on Not Necessarily the News. Jay in an exclusive heartfelt one-on-one -on -one interview about the joys of being a child star and growing up in Hollywood. In 91, he told Katie Couric he hated with a passion working on Dennis the Menace, mostly due to his aunt and uncle who was responsible for him on the set. He did speak highly of the cast, which is good. The cast was wonderful. Herb Anderson, Gloria Henry, Jeannie Russell, uh, all wonderful people. In but it's unfortunate that he hates the series with such a passion because it was such a fun show to watch. It's made me laugh a lot over the years. He did an interview in 2011 with a couple of his fellow castmates from Dennis the Menace, and at this point it didn't seem to show any bitterness to the show, but that, of course, that could have been out of respect for his castmates and possibly for his fans as he was doing a convention appearance at the time. It feels wonderful, wonderful just to be reunited with these lovely ladies. Pebbles was voiced by Sally Strutters, you know, Gloria from All in the Family. Yep, a dab -a doozy just from that series, I would have never thought of her as Pebbles, ever. But she did okay. After all, I am the star. Looking at her credits, it doesn't look like she uh, ever did any additional voice work as Pebbles later on after this series, but she did do a lot of uh, other animated series here and there, like Tom and Jerry Kids and Tiny Toons Adventures. One of the uh, friends of Pebbles and Bam Bam named Moonrock was voiced by Lenny Wainrib. Hopefully I pronounced it correctly. It only works at my command. Watch! He was all over Saturday mornings for years, including a live-action Saturday morning segment of the Croft Super Show, Magic Mongo, in the 70s, and as the voice of H&R Puff and Stuff. And maybe you remember this ABC nutrition spot he did, Time for Timer, back in the 70s and 80s. Bang, bang! <laughs> oh, howdy, partner! Time for Timer! Do you ever get that hungry feeling after school? I must have seen that ad a million times growing up. Oh, and you might remember Inch High Private Eye, the tiny detective. Don Messick, the original voice of Scooby-Doo, does the voice of one of the kids in the show named Schlepprock. What you got there, Pebbles? It was my masterpiece till you showed up. In his lifetime, he used his voice on countless cartoons. He was Astro, Papa Smurf, Ranger Smith, Muttley, Banded, a couple of Transformers, one of the Tiny Toons, Scarecrow from the Challenge of the Super Friends, and just on and on and on. Unfortunately, he passed away back in 1997 at the age of 71. Uh, okay. <laughs> scooby dooby doo Schlepprock was totally jinxed. Every time he walked into a room, something would break. Hi, fellas. Miserable day, isn't it? Yeah. Now, Alan Reed did Fred's voice pretty much up until his death. His last turn as Fred Flintstone was a cameo in Scooby's All-Star Life Olympics. Gene Vanderpeel was doing the voice of Wilma Flintstone pretty much up until her death in 1999. Gay Hartwig took over as the voice of Betty Rubble that was previously voiced by Gary Johnson and Petticoat Junction's B. Benaderet, who had to quit the original series due to scheduling conflicts. Mel Blank was Barney Rubble, of course, but this wasn't the only caveman voice he did for Hanna-Barbera. Today we're going to talk about the Ruby Spears produced Superman 1988 animated Saturday morning television series that aired on CBS. Fights the never-ending battle for truth, justice, and the American way. It came out the same year as the live-action syndicated Superboy TV series, which at the time was the 50th anniversary of Superman's creation. The 88 Ruby Spears Superman had DC Comics' Marv Wolfman as the head story editor, and comic artist Gil Kane provided character designs. Superman had previously had a cartoon series produced by Filmation and was a member of the Super Friends, of course, which almost all kids from the 70s and 80s watched one time or another. Now this series took its inspiration from Superman the movie where they adapted the John Williams score into the intro. Faster than a speeding bullet. As well as the uh, opening narrative for the George Reeves Superman way back in the 1950s. Faster than a speeding bullet. And off of the John Byrne revamp in the comics that happened in 1986. 
Now, uh, this was a reboot of Superman that had been in the works since Crisis on Infinite Earths, where DC editors and Marv Wolfman had been planning to redo Superman by deleting his career as Superboy in the comics. They also wanted to lower Superman's powers and change Lex Luthor somehow. Now, when John Byrne left Marvel, it gave DC an opportunity to hire him on to do the, uh, the Superman reboot. The result was the Man of Steel miniseries that started Superman over from scratch before leading into the new Superman for the 80s and action comics in his rebooted title Superman. Burns' run made Superman's cape no longer indestructible, and he turned Lex Luthor into an evil tycoon businessman instead of just an evil scientist. Krypton was radically changed, which to me was probably the worst part of what Byrne did. Everything else was great, though. It worked pretty pretty well. But as a longtime Superman reader, I do miss the older pre-crisis stories of the Silver Age. It seems the older those stories get, to me, the better they get. Now, if you'd like me to do a video on the burn run sometime, just let me know in the comments below. The 88 cartoon version of Luther used the same kind of Luther as the 86 comics. No longer was Luther running around in that same purple uniform, living in the Hall of Doom as he was in the Super Friends. Now he was living in Metropolis in control of a huge business empire. Now the Daily Planet characters were all there. Superman was voiced by Bo Weaver, who went on to do the voice of Mr. Fantastic in the 1994 Fantastic Four animated series. But I can't give up! Jimmy Olsen wore a tie instead of the bow tie, and Lois had a 80s style haircut. Besides the regular Superman adventures, the show had a segment entitled The Superman Family Album, which devoted a few minutes every episode to Clark Kent's adventures as a super kid. It showcased Clark's life growing up. We got to see Clark as a baby, his first day at school, his first shopping trip, and Clark Kent's driving test. No, a little more! Lex Luthor was voiced by Michael Bell, who did the voice of Bruce Banner in the 80s Hulk cartoon, Duke in the G.I. Joe series, Plastic Man, Zan and Gleek on the Super Friends, and a lot of other cartoons of the 80s. Luthor wasn't the only Superman character to show up on this series. Zod made an appearance in the episode The Hunter. The Prankster shows up in the episode Triple Play. He was voiced by Howard Morris, a.k.a. Ernest T. Bass, from The Andy Griffith Show. And a ton of cartoon voices, including the voice of Adam Ant, the Hanna-Barbera superhero ant of the 60s. Jonathan Kent was voiced by Alan Oppenheimer. He was Rudy Wells from the Six Men Are Man from 73 to 74. He also did the voice of Frady Cat, a 70s cartoon series I totally missed back, uh, back in the day. And that's F-R-A-I-D-Y, no relation. Perry White was voiced by Stanley Ralph Ross, who wrote for the 66 Adam West Batman series on every fourth episode, and he wrote a lot of the shows for the Monkees, and he did development work on the Wonder Woman TV series with Linda Carter in 1975. Now, Tress McNeil was the voice of Martha Kent. She went on to uh, do the voice of Dot from the Animaniacs. Jenny McSwain did the voice of Lois Lane, and she's listed on IMDb as voice director for a huge number of animated series. Mark L. Taylor was the voice of Jimmy Olsen. He played on movies like Inner Space and Honey, I Shrank the Kids. Wonder Woman guest starred in the episode Superman and Wonder Woman vs. The Sorceress of Time. I'll get this one! <laughs> they were 13 episodes in all. And you can get the entire series on DVD and Amazon. On this video, let's count down the animated series of the 70s and 80s that were spun off from live action primetime television. This list doesn't contain shows like the Super Friends, Superman, Batman, and other superheroes that were primarily thought of as originating from comic books more than their live action counterparts. Gilligan's Island originally ran from 1964 to 1967, but was a bigger part of the 70s than it was the 60s, thanks to reruns. The show about a group of island castaways was turned into two different animated series. The first was The New Adventures of Gilligan, produced by Filmation, airing on ABC on Saturday mornings in 1974. There were two seasons, 
made of that series. The original cast came back except Tina Louise and Don Wells, the actresses that played Ginger and Marianne. The next cartoon for Gilligan was Gilligan's Planet that aired on CBS in 1982. Here on Gilligan's Star Planet! Oh yeah. This time Marianne's Don Wells was back and she also took over doing the voice of Ginger. Adam's Family TV series originally ran between 1964 and 1966. The Adams Family showed up on the new Scooby-Doo movies in the 70s and included most of the actors from the original series. But then when it became an animated series in 1973, Ted Cassidy returned once more as Lurch and Uncle Fester's Jackie Coogan returned, but John Astin and Carol Jones did not. The Adams Family also had an animated series in 1993 where the only original actor to return was John Astin. The Lone Ranger TV series ran from 1949 to 57 and was turned into a cartoon series twice. Now, the first one was in 1966, but the second one was in 1980. The original actors didn't come back, but in 1980, William Conrad was the voice of the Lone Ranger. He was really famous. He played as the Detective Cannon in the 70s, and he also starred in the 80s Jake and the Fat Man. The Lone Ranger! Return with us now to those thrilling days of yesteryear. From out of the past come the thundering hoofbeats of the great horse Silver! Now, the Brady Bunch TV series aired between 69 and 74 and was turned into an animated series called The Brady Kids in 1972. And that featured the kids of the show. The original actors came aboard for the first season, but a couple of them bailed on the second season. The series actually guest starred Superman, Lois Lane, and Wonder Woman once. It actually came before Wonder Woman's Super Friends debut. Lassie ruled television for years before getting her own animated series in 1972. I'm not sure who voiced Lassie, but it has been said that Lassie's trainer, Rudd Wetterwax, hated the series. He said, quote, The manufacturers of this rubbish have incorporated violence, crime, and stupidity into what is probably the worst show for children of the season. Space, the final frontier. Now, Star Trek became an animated series in 1973. Most of the original cast returned. It even earned an Emmy for Outstanding Entertainment for a Children's Series. The 70s TV series Emergency was adapted into Emergency Plus Four in 1973. Cartoon features the show's two main characters, young firefighter paramedics Johnny Gage and Rory DeSoto, voiced by the actors who played him on the primetime series. It also added a plus four of young people trained in life-saving techniques, along with their pets. Now, Happy Days and its TV spinoffs, Laverne and Shirley and Mork and Mindy, ruled the 70s, but they didn't get an animated series until the early 80s. First, Fonzie, Richie Cunningham, and Ralph Mouth became time travelers on the series Fonz and the Happy Days game in 1980. I always wondered why Potsy didn't uh, show up on that series. Now, in 1982, an animated series was created called Mork and Mindy slash Laverne and Shirley slash Fonzie. Now, practically every kid in America was watching the Dukes of Hazzard TV series about fast cars like the General Lee and the bumbling Sheriff Roscoe B. Coltrane. Now, it got turned into an animated series called The Dukes, which included the main cast members as the voices. But in the first season, it was the replacement Dukes, Coy and Vance. And then in the second, it became Bo and Luke as they came back to the primetime series as well that season. Now, ALF was a popular kids' comedy in the 80s and was adapted into an animated series in 1987. ALF's voice, Paul Fusco, was the only one from primetime series to appear. It showed us what ALF's life, life was like on the homeworld of Melmac. 
Hey, if you like animation, we got a playlist of animation history and original cartoons I created for the TV Crazy Man channel. And also check out my other channel, Freddy Cat Cartoons, for original family friendly cartoons. So please subscribe, hit the bell for future notifications. Thanks for watching and have a great day.